Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Kira Darycheva. I'm an associate professor at the Department of Mathematics at Hofstra. And it's my pleasure to present my colleague and old friend who is visiting Hofstra University second week and giving his fourth talk during uh, his um, visit to New York area. Um, Professor J.B. Nation, he worked uh, the last 35 years in the University of Hawaii and he studied at Vanderbilt University and got his PhD at Caltech. Um, he worked in many areas of mathematics, uh, such as universal algebra, lattice theory, group theory, coding theory. He collaborated with biology department on different um, applications of mathematics. And since 2010, around this area, he started also collaborating with a cancer uh, center, uh, which is a part of University of Hawaii system, and also with medical personnel of um, Queen's Hospital associated with, medical, with this cancer center. And we work together also as a collaborator since a long time, maybe 2001, but we knew each other way before that. We wrote many papers and um, book chapters, and it was mostly in algebra, but recently we also started doing this um, applicational uh, research, in particular in medical studies and um, studies of cancer. Um, and so his talk today, which is a fourth talk of in two weeks, but will be on a completely different topic than what he presented before in mathematics department. And um, this is what mathematics can do to tell us about cancer. So please welcome Professor Nation to the podium. And I please uh, maybe hold your questions to the very end, if possible. So we will have a QA session at the end. Please welcome. Thank you. So, so welcome to the algebra seminar. Uh, no, actually, I'm going to talk on cancer today. Um, I'm pleased to be here. Uh, this is sort of an extended tour, and uh, starting out in Tennessee and going to Virginia and Minnesota, Kentucky, South Carolina, and finally here. And I appreciate you holding off the winter until uh, we get back to Hawaii. So, <laughs> uh, on a slightly serious note, I want to sort of dedicate this talk and do the project to uh, my friends and family members uh, who've had cancer and uh, those who survived and those who haven't. And the reason we work on these things is because these people are important to us and it's going to require an interdisciplinary effort. And that's the sort of thing I want to talk about. Uh, be mathematics and biology. So whichever your specialty is, part of it will go over your head. Don't worry about that. There will also be some alphabet soup. Don't worry about that. Try to get the general context. Okay, having said that, um, there we go. Uh, of course, the, the body is complicated. And uh, when you have cancer, then many things get disrupted. And what we would like to do is some sort of mathematical analysis of the data to figure out what factors are involved uh, in that disruption, both things which are causing the disruption and things which are just symptomatic of it, and then to use that to point to biologists as to what they should study and hopefully then maybe find some cures. Um, this is joint work with uh, people from the Cancer Center, uh, uh, Gordon Okamoto and Tom Linska, but also uh, Asmita Akari from uh, Northeastern University, uh, my two student assistants, uh, Jenna uh, Belegro and Tammy Oshioka, and another student assistant, uh, Henry Zatello. Uh, so this is a project that involves people with different backgrounds, uh, and particularly involves some students. So students can get involved in this sort of work and have been very useful uh, in helping me, including with the preparation here. Um, okay, so here's a quick outline. We will describe how things work normally and then how they go wrong uh, in cancer. This will be a very broad outline, uh, particularly aimed at sort of mathematics people who know very little biology. And 
then about the mathematical part is how you analyze the data to try to figure out what the factors are in the disease. Uh, for, so from the top, what we're really going to look at are the factors that make some cancers more aggressive than others. Okay? And within a given type of cancer, what are the factors that make some people have a much worse, more aggressive, or less aggressive uh, type of cancer? And this sort of thing will show up in the data. Okay? Uh, so here's your basic biology course. How does uh, DNA work normally? Well, what you have is, is your, your chromosomes, the DNA, send uh, messenger RNA, and that goes down and forms proteins, and proteins perform the task within the body. Simplification, but it's how it works. And those tasks include cell building uh, and replication, uh, energy conversion, and it's metabolism, providing energy uh, and respiration, uh, immune response, and apoptosis, which is programmed cell death. And then there are various factors that affect it, including microRNA and methylation. They can be analyzed by these same methods, but that's not what we're doing now. Uh, and what happens normally is you have a balance between the cell death okay, and the cell duplication. And as long as everything is in balance, then you're, you're healthy. Uh, when things go south, then there's various things. So you have mutations of genes, and you have DNA repair genes. And they come along and they correct those. If they cannot correct it, the cell dies through apoptosis, and the immune system comes along and gets rid of the dead cells, okay, or, or the damaged cells. That's the way things are supposed to work. Why don't elephants get cancer? And that's because they actually have 20 different types of DNA repair genes. Okay, so when they get a mutation, okay, then it gets fixed, okay. And when you get a mutation, a lot of the time it gets fixed, but not always, okay. If you had 20 DNA repair genes, then everything would escape. Uh, you never would have this problem. Of course, you'd also be an elephant. You have to eat peanuts. You know. Okay. So what happens in cancer is this thing gets out of balance. Okay. Mutations occur faster than they can be repaired. The balance tips tips in favor of cell division over uh, uh, apoptosis. Tumors form which are, of course, just masses of rapidly reproducing cells. Uh, and this is reflected in the gene expression. Now, whenever I write mRNA, you should just think gene. OK, that's a, the common name for how these things are regulated. And everything gets dysfunctional. Uh, an example is uh, the Warbeg effect, which is that uh, tumors, more aggressive types of tumors, tend to switch uh, their metabolism from burning fats and lipids to burning sugars, okay? And it's less efficient, but who cares because you're just running wild anyway. And so it turns out that this is a measure, and we'll return to this uh, later, of how aggressive the cancer is going to be, at least in liver cancer. Um, and then tumor cells have a way of avoiding apoptosis, uh, which um, I think I don't understand very well, but they also have a way of masking themselves so they look like normal cells. And that's pretty simple. This immune checkpoint system is what keeps your immune response from targeting normal cells. Okay. And uh, the tumor produces uh, proteins that go and turn on the immune checkpoint system so that the system, your immune system, does not attack the tumor. Okay. And so what it's supposed to be doing doesn't happen. Okay. So essentially they're disguising themselves. Okay. Um, so what can you do about this? Well, one thing, of course, is you can simply cut out the tumor. Uh, a second thing you can do is kill the cancer cells, either with chemotherapy or radiation. Another thing is to try to get the immune system to do the job, which means you have to unmask the cells. If you look on TV, you see countless ads for Opdivo or Keytruda. That's what they're doing. Those are anti-PL1 uh, drugs. They uh, uh, unmask the tumor 
so that it looks like a foreign body and the immune system attacks it. Okay. And, um, or some combination. So combination therapies are more likely to be effective. Okay. Um, now, meanwhile, the National Institute of Health has collected the cancer gen genome <laughs> atlas. There we go. I'm missing a word here. And so uh, basically gene expression and mutation expression and methylation for 30 different types of cancers. And the number of patients for each cancer uh, varies. Now, there are other repositories of data like this. But the nice thing about this one is everything's a uniform protocol, okay? The same clinical data for every cancer, every patient, the same gene expression for every cancer, every patient. So it makes it easier to compare data, okay? And in particular, it's always the same 20,531 genes. So we can look at different cancers and see how they operate on those genes. Um, so we're going to talk about an algorithm that will compare cancers in this way, okay? And there will be variations amongst cancer patients. Now, you'll probably think to yourself, why don't you just do tumor versus normal, but where are you going to get the samples from normal people? You can't just go grab people off the street and say, I need a section of your liver right now, okay? So it would be nice to have that, and that would be a different study. Uh, but really, we don't have a sufficient number of samples to do a good analysis. But what we can look at is what makes tumors more or less aggressive. Okay. So this is a sample distribution of a gene. So the gene uh, uh, expression can either be low over here or high or somewhere in the middle. Okay. Now, for the math people, this is actually transformed data. This has been log transform and quantile normalized. Okay. But after that, it looks like this. Okay. And so what you would like to know is what's different about the patients who are overexpressing or underexpressing uh, uh, that protein. Okay. Uh, so the gene is either underexpressing or overexpressing simultaneously. Oops. Oh, sorry, wrong button here. So a metagene is going to be a collection of genes that are behaving the same. They either simultaneously overexpress or simultaneously underexpress. Okay. If so, they're probably involved in the same biological process. Okay. And what we want to do is look at if gene, I'll call them X and Y, if gene X overexpresses, then the conditional probability that Y overexpresses when X overexpresses is big enough, then that means those two are linked. We need the same thing to happen for underexpression and for Y controlling X and X controlling Y. If all that happens, these genes are behaving the same and should be part of some common process, which may or may not be related to the cancer, okay? but some common biological process. So, um, here's an example. So this is a random example. We have a lot like this. This is called a heat map. Okay. And so these are the genes, just 1 through 13. And here's about 200 patients or so. Okay. And if it's red, it means that patient is overexpressing. So for example, this patient, first ones here, are all overexpressing gene 1 to 13. And likewise, the other patients are underexpressing the same gene. Okay? So for a given patient, they're either over on all of them or under on all of them. And there's a few in between, which are neither. Okay? But a metagene means this. These 13 genes, whatever they are, okay, uh, a patient will either overexpress all of them or underexpress all of them most of the time with, of course, some uh, difference in the middle. And then we need to find out what that thing does. Okay. Now, this is, like I say, just one of many of them. I don't really remember which one it is. But, um, okay. So uh, let me sort of skip over the technical details. 
Uh, I've also given this talk for a math colloquium, and uh, this, this is sort of the, the details uh, of how we set it up. But essentially, you want to think in terms of overexpression, underexpression, like the last picture, and we discretize the matrix using plus ones, zeros, and minus ones, and then look at conditional probabilities. Okay? And genes are equivalent if they overexpress at the same time or underexpressed at the same time. Okay. Time for a quick picture from a postcard from Hawaii. Uh, this is from a uh, trip which uh, Kara and I took uh, a hike with uh, my daughter this summer. And uh, uh, you think of beaches, but there were actually some very nice hikes up in the mountains, and this is one of them. Okay. Now, the top line, which is also part of the plan. The second part of the plan is you want to take a hike in the mountains of Hawaii. The first part is we're going to try to compare 16 different kinds of cancer, okay? Uh, mostly solid tumors, so not leukemia, okay, or lymphomas, but solid tumors. And I threw in uh, one extra one because I was doing some of the similar th types of things. And not surprisingly, the number of patients varies from, uh, from Kidney, now this is three different kinds of kidney cancer, but for the uh, cl clear cell uh, kidney cancer, there's 533, and uh, for the bile duct cancer, that's liver cholangial carcinoma, there's only 36. So we need a method that will apply over a wide range of number of patients. But again, the number of genes is 20,531. If you're in math, think a very tall, very skinny matrix. Okay, um, and for all of these, except prostate cancer, we have clinical data on how long patients survived, you know, uh, also how long they were disease-free and so forth, but I'll be concentrating on survival. Um, there's data for prostate cancer, but it's got some errors in it. Okay, so what happens is you run this algorithm called the LUST algorithm, uh, which is for lattice upstream targeting algorithm, and it will start finding metagenes for each cancer. Now, most genes are not involved in this process. That is, they do not have a sufficient amount of variation, or they are not in any way coordinated with other genes to do anything. But you will get somewhere between four and about a dozen, 15 groups of genes that behave just like that picture of the heat map. They're all expressing together or overexpressing or underexpressing. And these will have anywhere from about 10 to about 300 genes, depending on how you adjust the parameters for the program. Okay. And some will be more important than others. Now, the question you have to ask yourself is how do you know that these aren't just random things? Uh, basic problem statistics is if you run 20,531 tests, okay, some things are going to be off the wall. For example, imagine if you had the time, flipping a coin, see how many heads you get in a row, you do it four or five times, it's going to be two or three. You do it 20,000 times, sometimes you're going to get 20 in a row. Okay, what does that mean? It means nothing. It means you flipped a coin enough times until you eventually got 20 in a row, which means you have nothing better to do. So <laughs> we have to worry about that. But when we run this thing on permuted data, this algorithm, which I just very vaguely described, you get nothing, absolutely nothing. Uh, you get no metagenes. One time by mistake, uh, I started it running and I forgot to put in the turnoff on it, and it ran 105,000 different permutations of the data and still got zero <laughs> metagenes showing up out of the 20, 105,000 times. Okay, it was supposed to be 5,000, but <laughs> these things happen. Any rate, so it, whenever you got that sort of false discovery rate, you're gonna lose some sensitivity, and that can't be helped. But uh, whatever we see is real, okay? You would expect, of course, that when you look at 16 different cancers, some things will be the same across cancers, and some things will be unique to a cancer. That's right, okay? The question is, which ones? And we want to find out based entirely on the data, not sort of what we study, 
Okay, uh, it happens, and I know a guy who studies a certain gene, and when he studies that gene, it shows up everywhere. But that's because that's the only thing he knows to look for. You know, he did his thesis on it, now he's going to do more on it. And this is not good because that gene turns out not to be important in any of the cancers he studies. Okay, so you have to just look at the data with no preconceptions and see what happens. Okay. And here's what you get. Now, there's a bunch of little numbers in here, uh, and so the metagenes are labeled, okay, not in any systematic manner. The first one I found was A, the, the second one was B, and the third one was C. After a while, I started getting X numbers, then I went back to the alphabet, okay? So these are metagenes, this set of genes, the same gene shows up in all of these cancers, okay? So as you see, there's three types, uh, sorry, two types of liver cancer, three types of kidney cancer, uh, pancreatic cancer, stomach cancer, uh, three variations on colorectal cancer, bladder cancer, uh, four different women's cancers. This one's somewhat different, but as long as we're doing reproductive cancers, we might as well throw it in, and prostate cancer, okay? And so I'll describe what these are some things show up only in some of them, okay? And others will show up only a few. The numbers indicate how important they are. So number one is the most important, number two is the second most important. And the second number tells you uh, the logarithm of the, of the p-value associated with how significant. So a bigger number tells you, means it's more significant. You have to be very careful comparing those, okay? But for example, this is not significant at all because it has a zero, and this one with a 60 is very significant. Okay. And um, so, uh, look at that. Um, and I'll return to this chart in a minute, but you notice some of these are in everything. Um, and in some are only in a few uh, types of cancer. For example, uh, Metagene E uh, shows up only with liver cancer. Now, that's two types of liver cancer. One is the regular liver cancer, and the other is the bile duct cancer. Uh, there are some things which show up only uh, in women's reproductive cancers. Those are over here, okay? There's two things that show up only uh, in pancreatic cancer. I'll return to that shortly. That's what you expect. The question is not, does that happen, but can you mathematically identify those particular genes, okay? So let's go to metagene A, okay? Uh, that's the one that showed up in everything, and that has to do with the immune response. How well you're going to survive your cancer depends a lot on how healthy your immune system is. Now, how healthy your immune system is a very broad statement, okay? There are, in fact, at least uh, three subparts of this uh, which are important as to wh whether they're functioning and um, return to it. But the patient's response uh, is important, okay? If you have chemotherapy or you have surgery and your immune system does not clean up what's left over, then you're still gonna die, okay? But if your immune system can respond, okay, or when you get uh, immune checkpoint blockade, your immune system can actually have T cells attacking the tumor, then you have a chance, okay? And that's what this thing is, and it's an important factor in every cancer. Okay. And the second thing uh, is just a metagene. Don't worry about the details here so much as the general idea that these are uh, functions related to uh, cell division and the, the cell cycle. And likewise, the third one is also related to cell building. Okay. So these show up in every cancer, or sorry, not every cancer. A and C show up in almost every cancer. B shows up in a lot of them. Okay. Uh, D uh, shows up in a lot. Uh, again, uh, more things to do with uh, uh, cell duplication and uh, uh, activity. Uh, K is rather special. Uh, but again, sort of similar. And now, finally I get to one L. The first ones are important. 
okay? But if you're not a biologist, you just want to know that there are important ones, okay? And also, an interesting thing, when you analyze the data for almost all cancers, you get this group of exactly the same 15 genes showing up, okay? Uh, it never um, predicts survival. It has no clinical significance. <laughs> and in fact, it doesn't show up in women's cancers. That's because uh, it's the, uh, has to do with the male Y chromosome <laughs> and sperm production. So it's not a big factor in ovarian cancer, for example. You know these things are there, but it shows up as if it was going to be important. It's not. Okay. Now remember, the initial analysis is only looking for which genes uh, coordinate with each other, not for whether or not they have any importance to your disease outcome. Okay, now here's some special ones. Um, X3 is actually a general one uh, having to do with cell division and uh, construction. Uh, Metagene E is interesting because it shows up exactly uh, with the liver cancers, both kinds of liver cancer, and is very good at predicting how aggressive the disease will be. Okay. And then, not surprising, uh, if you look at pancreatic cancer, uh, there's a, a totally different set of genes from anything else, and it's related to insulin production and digestion. Okay. Uh, so you would expect that how aggressive your disease is would be reflected in the genes that have to do with uh, uh, insulin production, and it is, okay? Again, we'll return to this shortly, okay? Time for a postcard. This from the same hike. This is my daughter standing next to a giant fern, <laughs> okay? Um, so, okay. Now, the first time we run the data, okay, it is unsupervised by any clinical results. Okay. You simply run it, okay, in mathematical terms, you look at all of these genes as a directed graph, and you ask, how can you get a subgraph of this that is very dense, having lots of edges? Okay. Those are metagenes. Okay. Those genes are doing something together which may or may not be related to the disease. Okay. And uh, now, we rerun the algorithm, but instead of trying to feed just look at how connected they are. We don't start with 20,000 genes. We start with just the metagene we found. So either the 300 genes, say, from the immune system, or the E genes just from, for liver cancer from uh, digestion. And uh, we put those together and start over. But this time, you measure not how connected it is as a graph, but whether or not it predicts survival, okay? In other words, you're comparing within a given kind of cancer how aggressive it is, okay? And you're doing that by seeing whether or not it predicts survival, okay? Now, that's called a signature. That's a, a common uh, term in bioinformatics for, for these things, okay? And then they determine how much the metagene actually affects uh, the patient's prognosis. Let's do some examples. I wanted to get to these graphs. Now, you've got to learn how to read these graphs, and that's one of the points here. Okay. Um, so this is survival. What we've done is taken kidney cancer and metagene K. This is not entirely a random choice, but I want to show you how to read this. Uh, so you, then you take each patient is assigned a score based on how they express uh, these genes. If they're overexpressing, they're actually in the red group. Underexpressing, they're in this group. Okay. And now, uh, this is the survival probability, and this is time and days. Okay. So this green line here is the 50% survival. Okay. So if you're in the red group, 50% of the people are dead at about 1,300 days, give or take some. Okay. If you're in the blue group at 1,300 days, about 90% are still alive, okay? This is the five-year mark, this green line here, the vertical green line. And so after five years, people in this group are about 82% are alive, and 
uh, in this group, what about maybe 30 percent, something like that. Okay. So these, how you're expressing these genes, which is an easy test to perform, not cheap, but interesting, will actually predict uh, how you're going to do. Okay. And it's more than that, it's reflecting something that's happening biologically, which is for biologists to study, not me. Okay, but it's pointing in the direction of exactly those genes. Uh, these are the p-values for how sure you are that these two are actually separate groups. And you remember those are supposed to be less than 0.05, but as you can see, they're, you know, 10 to the minus 13, 10 to the minus 14. Um, so that's less than 0.05. This is a set of 21 genes for uh, uh, the regular uh, clear cell kidney cancer. Um, here's something similar for cervical cancer, okay, and you won't see much different except you notice that this is slightly higher, and basically that's because for cervical cancer the diagnosis is much better. Uh, so people are diagnosed earlier and the results are generally better. Okay. Um, and just to be sure, what we're looking at here, you can also look at just all patients within the, the group you're studying and ask, what is the goal? What is the most that could possibly separate it? And this is the most possible. Okay, so if you ignore any metagenes, any signatures, and just look at the long surviving people, you see that, you know, uh, there's a, a large percentage of people who are in the top group and uh, a large percent in the bottom group, okay? This actually looks at the longest surviving quartile and the lowest surviving quartile, and these are the means for that, okay? So this is a target for what you might like to achieve with something like this, and you can see it's pretty close in this case. They're not always this close. I'm showing you the good results, but um, now here's something of interest. This is pancreatic cancer. A good friend of mine passed away from pancreatic cancer. And as you can see, the blue line is not very good. Okay. And this is basically what happens. People have just, uh, and this is all patients, but there are some people with pancreatic cancer who have a less aggressive form. Okay. And then after five years, 70% of them are still alive. Now, this is not a large group. Okay, this is sort of the median of the top quartile, but those people are out there. Okay, it would be good if you could identify them. Okay, because then you could say maybe we should try something different for these patients because they have a possible prognosis of survival. Okay, and so can you do it? And this is the metagene I. This is the metagene that's related to insulin production. Okay, and Okay, so it's supposed to be 70% in five years, and it's getting just below 60%, okay? So it is distinguishing those patients, okay? Not perfectly, but pretty close, okay? Um, so this is the kind of thing we have in, our, in mind. If you can identify patients who have more or less aggressive cancers, then you can treat them differently, okay? And so, uh, this is the signature itself, okay? Let me return to uh, liver cancer. I work with the liver cancer group at Queens Hospital, okay? Uh, what happens if you have stage one liver cancer is basically uh, they do a resection and that's it. I mean, there's some drugs they give, but they're about 2% effective, okay? And so what happens is uh, in the next 500 days, about 15% of those patients die, okay? And then over the next three and a half years, another 10% die, but 75% of them live five years or longer, okay? What you would like to do is identify those people who had the more aggressive form because then you can treat them differently, okay? You need a signature that does that, okay? And then you can figure out how to do it. Okay. And the signature on metagene A is actually, uh, I don't think there's a picture of it, but that's the one that identifies them with about 80% probability. Okay. Now, 
this is not surprising. Remember, stage one, this means it's not pr particularly progressed. They do a resection. Some parts, you know, you're not going to get all the cancer cells. If your immune system is responding properly, it'll take care of the rest. Okay. But maybe this suggests that some other sort of treatment should be involved, for example, immune blockade for those patients. Okay. Uh, or something different. Okay. So all this is part of personalized medicine. And personalized medicine means realizing that just because you have a type of cancer, uh, it's different. You're familiar with, with it from breast cancer and the onco DX test, but the same thing applies to almost all cancers, and we're looking to develop those sorts of tests. Okay? Um, so I'm going to skip this one. It's about a similar thing for uh, uh, liver cancer and uh, a different type of um, immune blockade that we're proposing. Okay. So basically, what I'm proposing is a method, and there are other methods which we also use, including methods from our group, for analyzing cancers and trying to determine which ones are more and less aggressive, but also what are the factors that make it more or less aggressive. Okay. Those are the things that should be studied. Okay. And um, this cannot be done by math people, but it can also not be done just by doctors. It has to be a collaboration, an interdisciplinary approach. Okay. What does that mean in practical terms? It means if you're a young person and you're going to try to do a biological research, then you need to learn some mathematics. Unfortunately, it also means if you're a young person and you're going to do mathematics, maybe you should learn some biology too. Okay. Uh, you cannot do interdisciplinary research uh, being totally ignorant. I've been very fortunate to have my student assistants who've patiently taught me a lot. Okay. It would have been easier if I'd learned it when I was in college, but I didn't. <laughs> and they were very patient. So uh, having said that, uh, thank you for your time. And in Hawaiian, mahalo, which means thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> In that heat map picture that you showed, I actually noticed there was some clustering on top, clustering of patients and clustering of genes. What were those clusters about? I I'm sorry. Clusters, clusters of genes and clusters of... Maybe we could go to the Yeah, go, go to the map heat map. map. Oh, go, go back to the heat map. map. Yeah, exactly. okay. The heat map. <laughs> okay. No, it's Okay, there we are. Yeah, so on the very top you have clustering obviously okay. of the patients and you have clustering of the genes. What are those clusters about? Well, okay, so we've used a clustering program to make it obvious what's happening. Okay. So you, your heat map clusters people with similar expression. So um, it will always attempt to make something like this. So again, here's, you can actually see it blocked off, that this is uh, gene 13 is exactly this row here. Okay. And so what it has done is tr attempt to cluster, not these. These are just in whatever order they're in. Actually, it does cluster them so that they look the same. And these are all the patients. So each column here is a patient. Uh, you can sort of see this patient here sort of running down here. Okay. And this patient is underexpressing everything, these more than those. That's the way you read that. So, yeah, so again, genes across here and patients down here. If you took a random collection of genes, not something coordinated, this would look like a kaleidoscope. Okay, <laughs> it would be a little patches of red and green everywhere because it can't put them together. And so what you're seeing is that patients you know, tend to always overexpress these 
or always underexpressing, uh, with a slight bias towards underexpressing in this case. Is that? It's, it's okay. Clear that you are clustering by this gene expression, but the point is, have you learned something from the clustering? Like these patients are of this type, and so on. So, I mean, you can numerically cluster anything you want, but uh, are they Maybe. actual groups? Like maybe explain more of uh, why you chose these genes. I mean, why, oh, I mean, what did you learn oh, from this? Experience? I didn't choose these genes. The program produces them. Okay, these are produced because they show up as a graph. So remember, in your graph, you have arrows from one to one. If the probability, uh, so it'd be an arrow from here to here means the probability of a patient overexpressing. 10 conditional probability, given they overexpress this one, uh, is high. Okay. And that's what you see, of course. The probability is, is not 100% because there's a few weird ones in here. But so the program simply runs the 20,000 genes, and of the groups it produced, this is one that had a pretty picture. Okay. But because I, and I chose this one simply because it illustrates what you're looking for. But all the ones it produces will have a similar uh, pattern. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> yeah. Um, I could even look up later which genes this are for which cancer, but it's, I don't remember. <laughs> right. More questions from students. Yeah. See, what's interesting, this has 13, which makes it easy. But when you look at the immune system, you get 300 such genes. That's not a random thing happening, right? And if you get 50 or 60, it's not a random thing happening. 50 or 60 with a picture like this. But the picture won't be quite as neat as this one because 13 makes it easier to see. Sorry. I just want to click. Is this on? Yes. It is on. OK. So you're clarifying that your, your, your group. <laughs> That's good. That's good. <laughs> you're grouping the genes based on what genes make a picture like this. That's how you're doing yes. it. OK. OK. I mean, not using the picture, though, but using a graph theoretic. Uh, look at the density of edges if you think of this as a directed graph. OK. So. And the edges are based on conditional probabilities. So, yeah. So, it's not surprising it shows up like this. Could you explain a little bit more about the met methodology? Uh, you said graph. So, was, is it like a weighted graph? And you had something like 16 cancers, right? So, were you doing it like one pair at a time? Um, and also, the third thing, computational complexity. I mean, does it involve like the algorithm? Does it involve major? metrics inversion or something like that. Um, I mean, do you need a big server to do this thing? Uh, so the, the method is we, we take the data, uh, expression data, we transform it until it looks more or less like a unimodal curve, and then we discretize it with a plus one for overexpression and minus one for underexpression, and then we look at the conditional probability if there's a one here is there a one here? And the same thing for minus one. Okay. So whenever you take real data and convert it to a discrete system of values, you lose some information. But you also denoise the system. Okay. All those things in the middle, which would tend to be a contributing factor, get just mapped to zeros and, and don't confuse the system. So. Uh, and I think the effect here is that denoising is more valuable than the, the slight loss of information you have as to who's on the borderline almost overexpressing but not quite or just barely overexpressing. Those people, of course, could go either way. If you adjust the sensitivity, you do get, of course, differences, but they are not qualitative differences. You will get the same set of genes, but maybe instead of 300 genes for the immune system, you'll get 250, okay, or 350, depending on which way you adjust your sensitivity. Okay. But you don't get any qualitative differences. There was also a 
question about complexity. Complexity. About? Complexity of the algorithm. Oh, complexity. Um, the, uh, it's not very complex. Right now, it is not programmed in parallel. Uh, so one of my objectives is to find a good willing student to take it and put it into parallel because it's very parallelizable, okay? Uh, you, it'd be very easy, and then it would run pretty fast. Right now, running it uh, on my home computer, a decent-sized set of data is about two to three hours, okay? So not bad. And the program is, I don't know, a couple thousand, 3,000 lines of code. Again, not bad. So. But the main objective uh, would be to make it run in parallel. There's process in parallel the different genes, and that would speed it up immensely. Yeah. And a student will do that. of a layman person on that math or science background. So I'm just wondering um, what inspired you, if there's something in particular, to um, get involved with this type of research, um, applying mathematics to cancer in your life, or if, if this was just something that you took on out of interest. Um, I took on it from several things. Uh, uh, here at Arishva, down here, and I were working on data analysis. Uh, at the same time, uh, one of my brothers and one of my sisters had cancer. They both survived. And I had a graduate student I sent over to the cancer center uh, just to get I was graduate chair at University of Hawaii and needed to find support for him. So these things sort of synergized to point me in this direction. Uh, but really, uh, I think that the most important thing is this massive amount of data that's just sitting there begging for analysis and not, we have methods for doing it, we needed better methods. And so I'll, what I did was, and this is maybe instructive to students, is I spent about three years trying wrong methods to analyze it, beating my head against the wall. And that's one of the reasons I'm fairly happy with these results, because finally you can see these things showing up. And we did not design it this way. We ran it, or, and you know, I'm sitting there looking at it, and I see the same groups of genes showing up. Okay. So it was really experimental in that sense. We weren't expecting the same genes to show up over and over and over. And what we were least expecting is to be able to take a signature, say, from liver cancer, and use it to predict survival for bladder cancer. But you can. You can actually, uh, you'd like to test things on independent data sets. We well, can use independent data sets from a different cancer as long as the same general metagene uh, is associated with it. So my motivations were personal and professional and all mixed together, just opportunistic. But. Uh, I think we need to encourage students to start thinking and professionals start thinking interdisciplinarily. So, thank you. If you have private questions, feel free to come and ask me.